All right, let's return to John chapter 10. Verses 1 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. And can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And may God bless this reading of his word in our hearing this morning. Let's go backward a little bit so that I can remind you that the immediate context for our passage is actually John 9, verse 1. When Jesus saw a man who was blind from birth. <clears throat> now, to moderns, this would be a medical mystery. But to the disciples... It's a moral mystery. Rabbi, they asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus rejects what he considers to be a simplistic question about sin and its consequences by saying this, neither. It was not this it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. 
Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What we saw is first, the disciples have a stunted view of sin and of sins. As if, as if humanity's plight in the world can be reduced to a series of bad moral choices and the inevitable harmful effects those bad moral choices produce. That's true, but what I'm saying is humanity's plight can't be reduced to that. It's John's Gospel that depicts the world as existing in a never-ending night. And night in the ancient world was dark. I mean dark. If your only sources of nighttime light are those little clay oil containers that have a flame here, or maybe a torch, then darkness means something to you, especially if you have no access to a lamp or to a torch. John's Gospel shows the world in a never-ending night, a perpetual and suffocating darkness that of course includes all sorts of bad moral choices, but is so much more than just bad moral choices. Because the denizens of this world love their darkness. They are accustomed to the night. Their eyes, and really all their senses, have adapted to it. We might say that they have become nocturnal creatures and they hate the sunshine. And so in chapter 9 I suggested that this man who was born blind indicates that human beings come into this world in the darkness, that the night is first before they ever begin making bad moral choices. In that sense, the man is a symbol. But he's also a real person. I even named him. I named him Amos. Not that I have any insight into that. It's just the first name that came to my head that at least sounded somewhat Jewish. So there was an Amos, but he was also a living symbol so that the works of God will be displayed in him. And the message here is daylight has come and Amos is about to see. And what he is going to see is Jesus. That's what we were told at the end of the chapter. No. Jesus said to him, you have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. You have seen him. That's operating on two levels at once. So that even though the Pharisees saw Jesus, and Amos's parents saw Jesus, and who knows how many people in the town saw Jesus, when Amos saw Jesus, he says, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He sees Jesus. So imagine for a moment you're in a theater and it's pitch black in the theater and suddenly a bright spotlight hits the middle of the stage and that is where Jesus is standing and he's giving sight. And with Amos he's not restoring sight he is giving sight for the first time to this wretched beggar who was born blind. 
What a wonderful scene. What next? A standing ovation calls for an encore. Well, if that's what you think, then you don't really understand just how dark this darkness is. Instead of a standing ovation and a call for an encore, all hell breaks loose in the theater. And that's what we've seen already. This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And it gets worse. Verse 24 in chapter 9. Give glory to God, they said to Amos. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 34. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast out poor Amos. And then the end of our passage. After Jesus' discourse, verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. And is insane. Why listen to him? And others said, these are not the words of the one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now remember, we're in the play's final act when this healing occurs. And the first four acts prepared us for this very moment. That's the Old Testament. But the darkness is so dense and so thick that those who were the most careful students of the Old Testament observed what was happening, saw a man born blind, given sight, and this is what they conclude. Yeah, the guy who healed him must be possessed by the devil. Either that or he's insane. That's darkness. Now, not everyone believed that. But it reminds us that the darkness disrupts our ability to think. And that's my first point this morning. The darkness disrupts our ability to think. In Psalm 146, it says, Yahweh sets the prisoners free. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. Yahweh lifts up those who are bowed down. Yahweh loves the righteous. What's praiseworthy in Yahweh, in the Psalter? Well, among many other things, that he opens the eyes of the blind and lifts up those who are bowed down. Now, I can assure you, after a very careful study of the Old Testament, I feel confident in saying that Satan and the demons are never described as giving blind people their sight or of lifting them up. And I know that Satan does not love the righteous. So when many of them said, he has a demon, we who have some distance from this think, really? I mean, seriously, is that... What you think, that's what you've concluded. You've read the Old Testament. You read Psalm 146. And yes, I know that these religious leaders are reacting, at least in part, to everything that Jesus has said here. But they're also reminded by those who haven't made up their minds, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Well, that's a rhetorical question. 
Of course not. And so surely when something like this happens, should we just jump to the conclusion that we need an exorcist for Jesus? So let's pause for a moment to take this in. Jesus gives sight to a man who came into the world blind. Just as in Psalm 146, so in all through Isaiah, Isaiah 35, that when the kingdom of God comes, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And these leaders who have memorized, I'm sure, Psalm 146 and Isaiah 35, they've decided, they've reasoned it out, that the very best way to explain what they've seen here, the very best way to interpret the event is Jesus has a demon. So his indecipherable teaching, verse 6, is as meaningful as the babblings of a lunatic. And with that I say, welcome to the darkness. Welcome to the night that never ends. And in the darkness and in the night that never ends, the very best human thinkers become irrational, even while they boast of their rationalism. They are dull in their thinking, even while they believe that their minds are sharp. So that the great tragedy in the story is the only way to escape this delusion in the darkness is to accept the message of a demon-filled, insane babbler. And that brings me to my second point. The Good Shepherd brings eternal life to his sheep. The Good Shepherd brings eternal life to his sheep. So Jesus again said to them, to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Wait, you're the door? Just a moment ago, you were the shepherd. How are you the door? How did this happen? Some scholars point to evidence that shepherds in the ancient world would sleep long ways at the sheep pen's entrance. That way, if anyone came near, they would be alerted. I don't know. Maybe. If it's true, that's kind of cool. Seems a little too convenient to explain a shift in the parable. So I'm going to suggest that this general shepherd and sheepfold metaphor is elastic enough to fit the main point in each section, which here is that Jesus himself is the entrance to eternal life. So in a moment, in verse 11, Jesus will return to his main metaphor that he's the good shepherd, in it, he contrasts himself to all sorts of rivals who really do their shepherd's work in a mercenary vein. But this brief switch, which kind of anticipates John 14, 6, the famous, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this brief switch serves to highlight the way to eternal life. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came. I came. This harkens back to the prologue. I came so that they may have life and have it abundantly. I like the sound of that. Who wouldn't want 
and abundant life. I mean, we name churches after those words. Abundant life, thus and so church. One translation, one that I kind of like because it's uh, kind of creative, the New Living Translation goes one better. My purpose, it says, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So how's that going for you? You're all living rich and satisfying lives? How much of the rich and satisfying life that you're living is a little bit closer to the standard of living in modern America and maybe not so much the fact that you're united to our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I think the New Living Translation got that one wrong. If it didn't, then I must be on the little faith side of the aisle here because I rarely wake up in the morning anticipating another rich and satisfying day in this abundant life of mine. Well, it's not a good idea to interpret a text through one's own experience, because I don't wake up that way. I don't go to bed that way either, come to think of it. But there are at least two main threads in John's Gospel itself that suggest a rich and satisfying earthly life is not what Jesus means here. This is a verse that is ripe for exploitation and manipulation. And I don't think Jesus has in mind anything like worldly prosperity. One thread will come further on when Jesus, whose whole earthly ministry has been characterized by rejection, plots against him, plots to murder him, and all sorts of antipathy and even violence against him, he tells his disciples that the course of their earthly journey is going to be hard for them. In the world, he says, you will have tribulation. Tribulation and a rich and satisfying life understood materially are like oil and water. They don't go together very well, if at all. But more to the point is the word life. John uses the word life 36 times in his gospel, nearly half of which, 17 times, are modified by the word eternal. There are 17 uses of the word eternal in John's gospel, and all 17 of them modify the word life, eternal life. So even when we see the word life in John without eternal attached to it, we're on safe ground, I think, to assume that it's eternal life. And I'll illustrate that for you. In one place, Jesus is in conversation and debate with the Pharisees. And he says to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The scriptures have eternal life. The scriptures witness to me, but you won't come to me in order to receive what I have, namely life. Now, we could go into even more detail on this topic, or we could just go down to verse 28. Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. 
So life in our verse, verse 10, is eternal life. The final exit from this never-ending dark night into which we have all been born is the resurrection. For that is what John means by eternal life. And I'll put in a little asterisk here, a little plug. For Sunday school this morning, I taught that the phrase eternal life came to us from Judaism. It is not new to Christianity in the Gospels. And so, if it's come to us from Judaism, from the Bible, Daniel chapter 12, but from extra-Jewish literature that employs the vocabulary of Judaism, eternal life comes to us predefined. And it clearly refers to the resurrection of the body. Eternal life means resurrection of the body. It's as much a quality of life as it is a duration. Okay? So you could go watch that. If you want, I'll just send you the notes. But isn't everything so much better when I say it out loud? So... Here's what Jesus says. Listen to it. I came in order to resurrect all of my sheep from the dead. That's why I came. I came to resurrect my people. So on the one side, we, the church, must oppose the thieves and robbers who take the words abundant life and make them into a faith life that enjoys uninterrupted material prosperity and health. Jesus has no idea what they're talking about. But we must also correct those who turn eternal life into heaven after we die. That's not what's going on in John 10. I came in order to raise my sheep from the dead. That's what Jesus is saying as the Good Shepherd. Human beings born blind and raised in darkness may long for material prosperity, but take it as a whole throughout the history and the ages, very, very, very few achieve it in order to enjoy it. They don't realize that they were made to live in the light, not to simply distract themselves with the pleasant things that the world has to offer. And this is something that I've talked about before and will again, and I think it's neglected in Christianity. Human beings born blind and raised in darkness, long for a better world. A world where people are treated with respect and honor, where justice is done, and where they can be happy, healthy, and safe. Now, the way they define these things and the way that they conceive to accomplish these things, well, there are a thousand different versions out there. But that's exactly what we should expect from people made in the image of God, but who live in a never-ending uh, darkness or night. Mm -hmm. Those internal urges for a good world are image of God urges, but in the perverseness of a never-ending night, they, they are defined a thousand different ways. And I don't think in their heart of hearts, many of them just want a disembodied existence in the cosmic realm. 
Maybe they do when they compare it to their existence in the darkness. But that is a point of contact for the Christian gospel. You want a better world characterized by justice, safety, harmony, happiness, and so forth. Well, that's what Jesus has come to bring. He came to raise his sheep from the dead in order to usher them in to his pasture. Mm -hmm. Listen to Jesus once more. I came so that they may have the fullness of eternal life as my sheep who go in and find pasture cared for by their good shepherd who loves them so deeply. Everything else is a twist or a perversion or a parody of that reality. And we have the reality in our message. One of my favorite speeches used to make my students listen to the key part of it is Churchill's finest hour speech. There's this wonderful line, and well, it's got plenty of wonderful lines, but there's one place where he says, if we, meaning the British Empire, if we can stand up to Hitler, all Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. I love that line. Freedom from the darkness of Nazi tyranny made more sinister by modern science as exploited by the Germans, free to move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. And if we fail in this, there will be a new dark age. Mm -hmm. Churchill survived the war, and then some. I think he was like 147 when he died. But if Jesus' sheep are to pass through Jesus into eternal life, then, now flipping back to the Good Shepherd metaphor, Jesus must give up his own life. And that's my third and final point this morning. Simply this, the Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The Good Shepherd, unlike those who came before him, which could be so many of the corrupt leaders of Israel, it could be the messianic pretenders who stir up wild enthusiasm and then lead people into destruction. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. You remember the story when David wanted to defend Israel's God by defending the nation's honor. He approached King Saul to offer his services. Saul looked him over and thought, you're not a giant slayer. Sorry. But David persisted. And he said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. Why? Because he's defied the armies of the living God. So Jesus' great ancestor was no hired man. He was no mercenary shepherd. He was a man who loved the flock that he owned, literally, the flock. Others see bears and lions and they go, you know what? 
There's nothing about bears and lions in my contract, thank you very much. I'm out of here. But David was more than willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And he never did. He won. But not so for his son and his Lord. So it turns out that the door to the broad, sunlit upland of Jesus' pasture is his cross and his tomb. Jesus must die for his beloved sheep to live eternally, eternal life. But like his father David, who survived his hand-to-hand -hand combat with bears and lions, Jesus is also willing to do this. And he does it very intentionally. Now when the time comes for Jesus to die, it won't look anything like that to most of the witnesses who were born blind and live their lives in a perpetual night. They will see not a good shepherd laying his life down for a sheep, but they will see a helpless, pathetic Jesus hanging on a Roman cross. And despite all the information in their own cherished holy books that they claim to love and believe in, they'll decide that the very best thing to do at the moment of handing Jesus over to the crucifiers is to declare their devotion to the Roman Emperor. We have no king but Caesar. That's the darkness. Welcome to it. Welcome to the night that never ends. Here the very best and most well-informed human thinkers are irrational, even while they boast of their rationalism. They are dull, even while they believe they are the sharpest knife in the drawer. And their tragedy is, if they have come into contact with Jesus Christ, that the only way to escape the delusion that they don't even know exists is to accept the insane babbler's message that he is the one who's come from God to raise his people from the dead. Now let's pause here to consider how can people who are blind see Jesus, how can people who are deaf hear the voice of their shepherd, know it's their shepherd, and follow him? How do the seemingly irrational become rational? Or to put it more plainly, who's a sheep? It's rather strange, I think, that there is nothing in our text in John 10 that speaks to those questions directly. Yet all the while, John seems to be giving us an answer, even if he doesn't put it plainly and crisply and cleanly in front of us. Jesus just talks about himself as the shepherd, and he has sheep, and his sheep hear his voice. Okay, how does that happen? Well, first, let's remember that Jesus is not holed up in the shepherd's office where he is working on his systematic theology. John stresses that Jesus has come into this world having been sent to it by God. We saw that in verse 39, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. It's kind of a strange mission. 
10.10 again, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Goes all the way back to John 1.11, he came, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. So as we read through John, we're observing this over and over again. It's real history, real life, where people make real choices that have real consequences. So, how do you become a sheep? Why does Jesus talk about sheep as if they already exist instead of inviting people to come and become sheep? That's what I'm asking. And I'd say that maybe John 3 provides the answer. And we'll come back to this as we continue on through John 10. But especially John 3, verse 8. John 3, verse 8. I suggest explains what's going on here in John 10. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, as I argued at length in John chapter 3, this whole concept of being born again or born from above by the Spirit is rooted in Ezekiel 36 and the restoration of Israel from exile. So, briefly, the Holy Spirit in John chapter 10, how shall I put this? He's creating, he's giving birth to, he's making Jesus' sheep. The sheep for the new Israel, the restored from exiled Israel, saved by Jesus to move forward into broad and sunlit uplands. So Jesus has sheep to die for. Sheep brought into the fold by that mysterious working of the Spirit that Ezekiel wrote about and John affirms in chapter 3. And as we'll see, it is a much larger and more inclusive Israel or sheepfold than any of those religious leaders dwelling in the never-ending night could have imagined. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus has sheep to die for. But his death and his burial are the doorway into God's pasture, broad and sunlit uplands where darkness is dispersed and there is nothing but sunlight and never ending day. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the Holy Spirit has given sight to the blind so that when we look at Jesus in John chapter 10, we see the second person of the Trinity sent by you into the world in order to lay down his life so that your sheep may have eternal life in a new creation. You sent him on a mission to retrieve us and the Spirit of God permits us 
to see the darkness dispersed, lay our eyes upon Jesus and say, Lord, I believe, then worship. And we thank you, our Father, mm -hmm. that the Spirit of God has opened our ears mm -hmm. so that when the shepherd speaks deeply inside of us, it seems intuitively almost beyond simple rational deliberation. We know that voice and we follow it because it's safe and reassuring and divine. This is all of grace. It is not of ourselves. We have nothing to boast of. Help those who live in that never-ending night to step into the sunshine, to see what we see and to hear what we hear. Join us in the sheepfold. Join us in the resurrection of the body at the end of the age. And now we thank you, O God, that our Lord Jesus has left for us a meal so that as we commune together as your people at the Lord's table, even here, he builds us up, edifies us, and strengthens us. And we want to return thanks for this good gift that we have, even as we praise your name. We thank you through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to the Lord's table, I thought I'd go to the end of John for a moment. It's a wonderful story where Jesus reveals himself, now the risen shepherd, to his disciples. And where does he do it? At breakfast. They're not all having cereal. They're having fish and bread. But you think about this. The Lord of glory, who, if we wrote the story, would appear hovering over the emperor's palace, instead goes to a lake where his friends are fishing, and he says, come, let's eat together like we used to. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, son of John, do you, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now what often interests us the most in that dialogue is the question Jesus asks and how Peter answers it and what that question and answer mean, what we may not notice as much is the charge that Jesus gives Peter. I have sheep. Peter, feed them. Take care of them. They will have tribulation in this world, Peter. I'm assigning you this responsibility. Feed them. Give them me. And in a sense, that's what's represented here at the Lord's Supper, where Jesus, in his church, feeds his sheep. 
He feeds us, of course, when the Word of God is read and preached, at least when it's preached responsibly. But He feeds us here as well. He says, come, let's have a meal together. We're friends. Let's have fellowship around the table. But in doing so, He gives us Himself and not just ordinary nourishment. So as we come to the Lord's table today, let's remember that the Good Shepherd came so that his sheep would experience the resurrection into eternal life. And in the meantime, he cares for us as a Good Shepherd by feeding us, nourishing us, and giving us the energy, the grace for the perseverance ahead. If you are not a Christian this morning, then you may understand my words, but you don't embrace them with love. You are more quick to listen to thieves and robbers and mercenary shepherds, but resist the babblings of a demoniac, insane man. But to those of you who have heard the shepherd's voice, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and it resonates in the deepest recesses of your being. Mm -hmm. Jesus feeds his sheep. If you're not a Christian, please don't participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. But to all the rest, come and eat, for here is where we are fed. Mm -hmm.